Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a shop assistant. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good morning, Jenny's Suit Rental. Jenny speaking. How may I be of service? Hi there. My name is Max Jones. That's J O N E S, and I'm looking to rent a suit out for a special occasion. Certainly, Max. We charge a set fee for our services. You can either choose from our designer range and pay fifty pounds to rent your suit out, or choose from our standard range at a cost of twenty-five pounds. So, what will it be? Oh, the first option, please, Jenny. Twenty-five、uh, pound, did you say? Unfortunately, not. The designer range is twice that price. Oh, in that case, I'll take the second option.、Uh, standard. Was that it? That's right. Now, before we go any further, may I ask how you intend to pay? Do you accept checks? Yes, but only in exceptional circumstances. We prefer cash or credit card. Well, as I haven't got one, does this count as、uh, those circumstances? Yes, that'll be fine. Make it payable to Jenny's Suit Rental. Will do. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now listen and answer questions four to ten. Now, Max, can I take your measurements, please, and a few details about what sort of suit you have in mind? Certainly. Let's start with the trousers, then, shall we? What is your waist size and leg length? I used to be thirty-two waist, you know, but these days it's more like thirty-six. Too many cream pies. I've been there. And about the leg, thirty-four. I wish. I'm afraid I'm somewhat lacking in the height department. Not even a thirty-two, thirty. I'm afraid. Never mind. As for the colour, could you do a dark grey suit? In fact, we have a very smart one of those in just your size. You're in luck. Now, what about shoes? Same colour? No, I think I prefer something darker. Okay, let's go with traditional black then, shall we? What about size?、Uh, I'm a size forty-five. Hmm. By my calculations, that's a、uh, ten in our sizes. And style? What have you got? We do suede, nubuck, and traditional leather. Definitely the last one. Very well. And will you be wanting a necktie? Do you do bow ties? Of course. I'll put one of those down on your order. Dark grey, I presume. Perfect. To match the suit. I think I fancy a light blue shirt. By the way. Might I recommend a green? Green would go very well with the suit you are renting. Light or dark? I'd say dark. Dark it is then. My next size is seventeen and a half.、Uh, hard to believe that a little over a year ago I could fit into a fifteen, isn't it? Those cream pies again, right? You got it. Now, what about your suit jacket? Same colour as the trousers, obviously, but what size? Medium should be fine. You sure? Yeah. And have you got any of those three button ones? I'm afraid not. The one and two button suit jackets are far more popular at the moment. In fact, the one button is all the rage. Let's have that one then. No problem. Now. That is the end of part one. You have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to her tour group. First, you will have time to look at questions eleven to eighteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to eighteen. So here we are in front of the entrance hall on the ground floor of this rather splendid twentieth-century building, once the home of Lord Redford of Graves, but which now, of course, has been converted into the National Art Museum. Now look straight ahead towards the end of the entrance hallway to where it narrows. That door will take you into the main exhibition hall. Alternatively, if you take the first right, you'll come to the modern art section, and next to that is the modern art studio, where you can see professional artists at work on their latest masterpieces. Fascinating. Taking a left off the entrance hallway, on the other hand, will lead you to the classical art section. If you look at the map on the entrance wall here. You will notice that there are two corridors running towards the back of the ground floor, one on the left and one on the right. They both lead onto the rear corridor, which is home to a further four exhibition rooms. On the far right, we have the landscape section. In the centre of the corridor is the still life section, and on the far left of the corridor there are two rooms. As you walk down the corridor towards them, the one on your left is the history of art room. And the one opposite is the digital art room. Right, let's get started then, shall we? Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions nineteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions nineteen to twenty. Our first port of call will be the digital art room down at the end. This exhibition has been open little more than a month, but has proved hugely popular with visitors so far. It is an interactive exhibition space, and visitors are encouraged to touch and feel the exhibits to their heart's content. Though, of course, I shouldn't need to remind you that this is forbidden in the rest of the museum. As is the use of cameras, so please ensure that you do not take any pictures once you leave the digital art room. That is the end of part two. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between two students and their teacher on a planned charity event. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, are you making any progress with your plans for our annual charity event? I guess first things first. Have you decided what charity it will be in aid of this year? We're thinking about help the children in Africa, sir. Well, that's Mark's idea, sir. But I myself prefer a local charity called the Meals on Wheels. I'd have to agree with Laura on this one, Mark. 
After all, we're supposed to be giving back to the local community, and although helping African children is a very worthy cause, it's a little outside our remit. That settles it, I guess. Moving on from the beneficiary question, have you made a decision on what type of event it will be? Yes, we plan on doing something a little different this year. We're calling the event Balloonathon. Basically, we're going to offer balloons for sale to all the students. Balloons? I don't see where you're going with this. Why would they want to buy a balloon? Well, here's the thing. We don't actually give them the balloon. Instead, we'll write their name on it along with the special phone number and then we'll release all the balloons into the air. When they fall to the ground, if a person finds one and rings a special number, then both he and the student who bought the balloon will win a gift voucher. That sounds like an excellent idea, guys. Well thought out. This balloonathon has a real novelty value attached to it, don't you think? Exactly what we said, sir. The only drawback is that the gas you put into the balloons is rather expensive. How much? About £20 per canister, and we'll need about 10 And how many balloons are you planning to blow up? Well, there are over a thousand students in the school, so if even one third of the students buy one, we'd need about 350 balloons. We've decided to order 500 so we don't run out. The good thing is we can return the canisters of gas if we don't use them, and the balloons aren't expensive, so there's no real risk of us spending a lot of money without getting a good return. You two have really thought this one out. I'm impressed. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Thank you, sir. So, how much money do you think we can raise? Well, each balloon costs about 1p, and when it's filled with gas, it's going to cost us about 50 pence. We reckon that if we sell our balloons at a price of £1.50 and we sell all 500 of them, we'll end up making a profit of £1 per balloon. So that's £500 in total. That's fantastic. And it gets better, sir. We've secured a sponsor for our event who's going to give us £1,000. How did you find a sponsor? The balloon company we approached about buying the balloons asked us if we'd be interested in letting them sponsor us too. What's in it for them? They're going to print their logo on every balloon. I think you've done a good deal there. Thank you, sir. So, do we have your approval to confirm our order? Absolutely. But, you know, I think we can sell more balloons if we set our minds to it. So why not order double the amount? A thousand instead of five hundred. We're going to need more than ten canisters of gas, then. Double the amount, presumably. Correct. OK, let's go for it. Let's make this year's charity event our most successful ever. That is the end of part three. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about philosophy. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Most of you, I hope, uh, will be familiar with the name Socrates. The ancient Greek philosopher is perhaps one of the most admired people in history. Socrates led a very noble life. He was, I suppose you could say, an optimist who believed in the good of mankind. According to Socrates, human nature leads people to act correctly and in agreement with knowledge. Socrates believed that evil and wrong actions arise out of ignorance and is famously quoted as saying, No man knowingly does evil. True to his personal beliefs, Socrates devoted his own life to seeking goodness and truth. Born in Athens, where he lived all his life, Socrates always dressed simply and was known for moderation in both eating and drinking. He brought his teachings to the masses, speaking regularly in public places, such as the busy streets of Athens, especially in the area around its great marketplace. He had little regard for public opinion, and always conducted himself in accordance with his own set of rules. Socrates built up a reasonably large following of Athenians looking to learn from his seemingly endless wisdom. But he also had a good many enemies who mistrusted him on account of his unorthodox views on subjects such as religion. Socrates' enemies were what you would call the wrong type of enemy, being powerful and influential Athenians. Their efforts to have him ruined saw him brought to trial on charges of corrupting the young and disrespecting religious traditions. In the trial, Socrates defended himself, claiming that he had done nothing more sinister than enlighten people with a clearer knowledge of the truth, which is essential for the correct conduct of life. He made some remarks aimed at the ruling establishment, uh, suggesting that those who are elected are not necessarily fit to govern effectively. Socrates himself had long ago become disenchanted with the materialistic ways of the upper class. Unfortunately, his views were seen as an attack on democracy and the electoral process, so the jury found Socrates guilty as charged and sentenced him to death. It is thought that many members of the jury resented his unbending pride and that this may explain the harshness of the punishment handed down to him. Despite being given several opportunities to escape prison, Socrates resisted and carried out his sentence calmly by drinking a cup of hemlock poison. During his life, Socrates introduced the idea that there are a set of universal standards by which people should be judged. His method, known as the Socratic method, involved discussion between two or more people around some key term. In theory, those party to the discussion should all define the term in the same manner. However, his studies found that this was seldom the case. Socrates encouraged his followers to engage in such discussions with the goal of trying to proceed from less adequate definitions to more accurate definitions over time the ultimate goal being a true and universal definition that could not be contradicted by anyone. This method tended to expose the ignorance of the Athenians of his day. It showed that many things that they assumed true were in fact false. Socrates also used irony to expose people's ignorance of key concepts. That is, he claimed to differ from others in recognizing that he himself was ignorant. His insistence on ignorance reminded other people of their own ignorance. 
but won him few friends in high places. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.